What's good, y'all? Welcome back to Believe in Mommy. He brought to you by the Believe Network. As always, I'm your host, Anthony DiNardo, coming to you with another long-form podcast. I'll probably try to start doing these once a week or so, but I'll see how much time I have. Anyways, that's about all the energy that I have for this episode. I'm not going to lie to you, because I'm recording this about 10 minutes after the Florida Panthers lose game six. And they are now affi- they have now officially blown their 3 nothing lead over the Edmonton Oilers in the Stanley Cup final. But the good news is we have one more chance to not make epic history and be the first team to blow a 3 nothing lead in the Stanley Cup final since 1942. So yes, if you are wondering, teams have blown 3 nothing leads in hockey before. It's actually happened four times as recently in 2014. So not too long ago, even though that is 10 years ago now. Jeez. But it, it, it has only happened once in the actual championship, which was basically in another life, lifetime, 1942. Things were, ba- things were different back then. So the good news for the Panthers, they got Game 7 on Sunday to not have the most epic collapse ever. And the only thing that I can say while I've been watching this run and, and really this collapse over the last week or so is the only thing I've been able to say to keep myself sane is... Thank God this is not the Miami Heat. Because if this was the Miami Heat, I would be going mental. Let's bring it back to last year, where the Heat were obviously up 3-0 themselves. Not in the championship, but in the conference finals. And that series was also pushed to a Game 7. Now, it's kind of hard to compare one series with the other because the Panthers have kind of got... I don't want to say they've gotten blown out the last three games because there was some empty net goals today to make it look a lot worse than it was. And in game two, or in game five, the the second to last game ago, they were kind of getting blown out, but then they made it close. And in the game four, they did get blown out. So it's a little bit different, whereas the Miami Heat, I believe they were up 3-0. And I don't think that game four or five was that close, if I remember correctly, but that game six was an absolute heartbreaker which was, of course, the Derek White buzzer beater. And I'll kind of relive uh, that experience real quick. I don't know why, but I'll tell y'all the story because it was quite possibly the the worst night of my life, which, you know, know, uh, being able to say that a stupid little sporting event is the worst night of my life, I've had a pretty good life, and I, I do acknowledge that. But that doesn't discount the fact that I was miserable. I was distraught that night. I really was. I was actually in New Mexico with my girlfriend, visiting her family. We got like a giant Airbnb. There was, you know, like a dozen of us in there or so. So there was a lot of people in there. Uh, And there's other people there that watch basketball, enjoy basketball as well. I was the only Heat fan, though. So, of course, I'm watching the game. Everyone's watching with me. And the whole game, they're looking at me because they know how big a game it is. If the Heat win, we go to the finals. And everyone is staring at me. And Jimmy had had a chance uh, to take the lead. He took the lead at the free throw line, if you remember, Al Horford fouled him. And he was able to right his wrongs of the year before, you know, missing that three-pointer on Al Horford. And I started getting emotional, man. Jimmy went to the free throw line, knocked all three down. And I, I was like, wow, they really did it. Like, Jimmy Butler is that dude. He's a magical, special person, and just just being able to right his wrongs is truly incredible, and I can't believe that after all of that, like the the whole series, the season that we went through with the playing tournament and everything, I can't believe they're going to be right back in the NBA Finals, and then Marcus Smart puts up a three, won't go, rebound Derek White, puts it in, and I say, oh no, don't tell me he got that off in time, and the second I saw the very first replay, I knew instantly that Derek White got that shot off and my face went from, you know, littered with tears of joy to just straight stone cold. All the excitement and emotion that had overwhelmed me instantly flew out of my body and I was just left with nothingness in a room full of a dozen people who were all staring at me, either trying to console me or make fun of me or laugh or you know, they, they don't understand the circumstances completely. It was it was a horrifying experience. Uh, now, luckily, we had a giant Airbnb in the mountains and uh, no better place to ponder than in the mountains. Am I right? So I sat out there on the balcony and just for a couple hours, and just looked out into the, the stars and just questioned why I even care about basketball so much. Uh, and it was a dark time, as you can see. But we actually flew home the morning of Game 7. And flying home, I was watching ESPN on the plane, maybe ESPN2 and all these other networks, FS1. And they're all talking about, oh, Miami's going to blow this. They don't have it in them. 
And right when I started hearing all that doubt, that is when I got my guts back. And I knew that every single time this Miami Heat team was doubted, that's when they would come to play their best. So going into that game seven, I had the utmost confidence in the Heat spanked that ass. Now for the Florida Panthers, I, as I'm not truly a giant hockey guy, you know, I keep up during the regular season and, and I really only started tuning into the postseason, you know, last year when they went on their Stanley Cup final run and this year the, the same thing. So I'm not the biggest hockey guy. I'm not super tuned in. But I don't know how to feel going into Game 7. This looks like a completely different Panthers team since Game 3. Now they've had periods here and there over the last few games where they look dominant. They just have a lot of, it looks like, easy attempts on goals. They just can't quite punch it in. And they have a lot of sloppy turnovers that have led to goals by Edmonton. So it seems like it should be easy to clean a couple of those things up and walk away with a Stanley Cup championship in Sunrise, at home, in front of your crowd at Amherst Bank Arena. Seems like they should be able to do that. But it also seems like they should have been able to do that today, or last game. And it hasn't happened yet. Uh, they got a lot of guys that need to step up, play better than they have been. I know Barkov scored today, but I still think he can do more. Obviously, Kachuk has been quiet other than his goal last game. Connor Verhage, where the hell have you been? I don't quite bring, blame uh, Bobrovsky because I feel like half the Edmonton goals are off fast breaks, off of dumb turnovers, and that's not Bob's fault. But uh, I want to win this one just because uh, even though I'm not a huge hockey fan, I know I usually talk heat basketball, winning, I, I support all the local teams that extends to the Marlins, uh, and I, I am a diehard Miami Dolphins fan, and I do watch all the Hurricanes football games too. Uh, so I'm tuned into the football and basketball side of things on the baseball and hockey, and even inner Miami. I, I do watch a little bit of them, but I just sort of keep up mostly. But winning a championship is not something you could take for granted. Uh, it's quite frankly something that might never happen again in my lifetime. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. Uh, I mean, look at the Dolphins. They haven't won in, what, 40 years now, at least. The Miami Heat has been over a decade for now. Them too. The Florida Panthers, it's been never. So you, you can never assume that you're going to see these things again. Uh, and I just want to be able to... to enjoy this and uh not not and i and i don't want to take this for granted this opportunity that the panthers have is because again even though i'm not the biggest hockey guy i have been way too way tuned in over the course of the last few months uh and i just you, you want to win this one you, you really do especially as a guy myself who's such a miami you know south florida sports fan but we'll see what happens monday i was hoping this podcast would be a celebration it is not we push it to monday but now let's get to the bulk of the episode, which I want to talk about is with the, with the uh, NBA draft coming up next week. It is on Wednesday, June 26th. I think it's Wednesday because I believe the draft is two days. Uh, so the uh, day one, yes, is on Wednesday with the second round being on Thursday, June 22nd. So I kind of want to talk about what type of player I think the Heat should draft. Of course, I've posted a ton of draft videos over the last couple weeks. We've talked about maybe maybe close to 10 players already. Everyone from Zach Eady to Eve Missy and Jared McCain, Isaiah Collier, basically everyone, right? And I will have my official top five out probably sometime this week coming up, maybe Monday, I'm thinking. I already did a top five uh, a couple weeks ago, but certainly my opinion has changed since then, especially since there's really not like a a certain candidate, you know, in this draft. There's not, you know, the tiers aren't super defined or nothing. Uh, so that's why I kind of want to talk about who the Heat should target. Now, I will say this. I am a big proponent of always taking the best player available. I don't care what the circumstances are. I don't care if you're a championship team. I, I don't care about none of that. Always take the best player available, especially if you're a bad team, though. I, I guess if you're a good team that's trying to fight for a championship, maybe if you were the Boston Celtics, okay, that I do get a little bit more. You may need some cheaper contracts to fill out the roster. But especially if you're a bad team, always take the best player available. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying the Heat are a bad team or anything, but that's just a philosophy in, in general that I tend to agree with. I mean, look at the Heat back in 2003. A lot of people th think they shouldn't have taken D-Wade, Pat Riley included. The story goes he wanted to take Chris Kamen because they needed a big. They already had Eddie Jones. Why the hell would they take Dwayne Wade? And obviously drafting Dwayne Wade changed the entire course of this franchise and we'd likely have zero championships if this franchise never drafted him. And they got all of that because they took the best player available. So if if not for the very least, maybe you draft a superstar like D-Wade. I know that is, you know, a outlier, sort of a once-in-a-lifetime thing. But if not that, well, then it is maybe the best bargaining chip for a trade. 
let's say the Heat are able to get a guy like Rob Dillingham or a guy like, I don't know, maybe a bigger name like Zach Eady. Does he have a lot more trade value? I don't know. At the very least, it can't hurt, especially when you're trying to get a whale. And you know that this draft pick is one that would obviously be included in any trade. So maybe not, Zach Eady is not the best example. Maybe you take one of these other guys who are really young with more potential. Maybe like a Ron Holland is a better example. Something like that. That is another reason I always believe getting the best available. But also, it's because drafting for fit, I think, is kind of stupid. Because I know right now a lot of Heat fans want to go for a center. They don't want to go for a guard because we have Tyler Hero and Terry Rozier. But there's too many moving variables. What happens if a trade we do a month or two from now includes Tyler Hero and or Terry Rozier and or Duncan Robinson or one of these other big contracts we have, which is really just our guards for the most part, right, outside of Bam Nabal? Well, now you're losing those pieces. And now all, all of a sudden your fit wasn't a guard, but now your, your needs does include a guard and you could have taken one in the draft. So I just think there's absolutely too many variables there when you're talking about trying to trade for fit, especially when you're the Miami Heat and you're looking to have an active offseason. And if anything, if you do draft a Devin Carter or a Jared McCann, Jacoby Waller, maybe now that makes Terry Rozier expendable or Tyler Hero. Guys that you might have been more hesitant to trade at first, now maybe you are more willing to. So always, always take the best player available just because I think it's so beneficial from so many different aspects there. Now, if we are talking about fit and what I think the Heat need most coming out of this draft, well, certainly last year, their biggest problems were size and scoring. Now, if you're looking to address uh, one of those two in the draft, it's kind of difficult because I'd say they're two polar opposites. Most of the bigs in this draft tend to be more defensive than offensive, and obviously most of the guards tend to be offensive than defensive. So i I kind of broke this down into two sections on really the best bigs and then the best guards, just because for the most part, you're talking, you know, fixing the size or fixing the offense. I don't think it's really possible to fix both with that first round pick. Now with the bigs, there's how many names that I list here? I listed, I listed seven names here, I believe. And I did it in order of guys that I want the least to the guy that I want the most. And some guys are more fours than fives, but you know what I mean? This is kind of your, your front court guys, power forward, center in the draft. The guy that I want the least is Zach Eady. Not not very unpopular opinion because it's pretty much, you know, he's a very polarizing player. You either hate him or you love him. I don't love him. He's a bit older. He's very slow. And because of that, I don't think he'll work well in this heat system just because they like to switch a lot on defense. And obviously you have spacing concerns there as well since Jimmy and Bam aren't really three-point shooters. And I, I just don't love the fit. Now, that being said, if the Heat took him, I would be immediately excited because that tells me that the Miami Heat believe they can develop Zach Eady. And if they think they could develop that 7'4", 300-pound behemoth, then I have no choice than to be excited because he obviously has a lot of the tangible tools like size. You know, he does have experience. I, I do prefer a bit of the older prospect. We'll get into that later. But... I just don't think he'd very he'd, he'd fit very well in uh, this Heat system, at least. Uh, Kyle Filipowski is the next guy. He's the like 6'11 center from Duke, can shoot the three ball pretty well, uh, okay rebounder, but just defensively, he's not great. And if I get a big in the draft, I want it to be a guy that can play defense just because we got bigs that could shoot. You know, we got Nicole Jovic, we got Bam Adebayo, who has a nice mid-range game. Uh, I don't I don't really see a great fit for Filipowski here. I'm looking for a guy that could maybe guard up, you know, the other team centers when Bam switched out onto the perimeter. And now, you know, your paint was always open last year. Guys were always getting rebounded. I don't think Filipowski fixes a lot of that just because he's a little more perimeter per, perimeter oriented. So I'm not a huge fan of him. Tyler Smith, kind of the same deal. He's more of a, a, a power forward, definitely better shooter than Filipowski. That's certainly what he does. But he's just too raw a prospect for my liking. And if we're trying to just draft the stretch four, I don't I don't see an immediate role for him on this team just because we do have Nikola Jovic. Khalil Ware is an interesting one because he might be the most talented of the bunch. He's a true seven-footer, dominant shot blocker, shot like 43% from three last year on like two and a half attempts a game. So some volume there, but not a lot. 
but he's just ultra athletic, like a, a pick and roll monster. Like I said, great defensively, can block shots, can move his feet. You can't switch him around. He definitely has the size. But there was a lot of rumors that his motor isn't great. It's kind of a low energy player. It doesn't seem like a heat culture guy. And truthfully, I tend to stay away from those guys because I I am under the belief that I like getting the guy with maybe a little less talent, but has the work ethic, because then I think you can turn that player into a really, really great player, and that's what the Heat seem to do. The next guy I do love a lot, it's Eve Missy, and to tell you about him, he's, he's basically a Clint Capella mold to a T, super athletic, great rebounder, great shot blocker. He is also a pick-and-roll monster. That's pretty much where the offensive game ends. But I don't care. Like I said, I want a big that can play defense. So when Bam is out of the paint, the Heat don't get screwed on the inside. And Eve Missy, I think, can play interior defense right now in the NBA. Super strong, super physical. You need a body like that when you go against these Jokic's and Embiid's. I am a big fan of his. The second to last guy I got in this category is Tristan Da Silva, who is basically also a stretch four. But he's just, he's a little bit more ready to play now than like Tyler Smith. He is 23 years old out of Colorado, basically 6'9", and he is a sniper. An absolute sniper, can shoot on the ball, off the ball, great movement shooter, coming off the screens, flying out, sitting in the corner, could do everything. And he's also fast enough to be a pretty switchable defender. He's not a great shot blocker, but he is a guy that could kind of hold his own one-on-one. -on -one. And I just think he is a superior all-around player right now compared to the rest of the guys I mentioned previously, even though he is basically that stretch four type. So I don't think he would start in the heat just because you got Nikola Jovic, but I do think he would have a defined role off the bench and sort of like a Kevin Love role uh, and maybe allow Kevin Love to not play as much as we need him to as the roster currently stands so he can sort of get some rest and stuff too. But Tristan De Silva is a guy that is ready to play now. Now, my favorite big in the entire draft is Deron Holmes II. Just dropped a video covering him a few days ago, and he's a guy that is 6'10", super athletic. Well, not I wouldn't say super athletic, but has good athleticism to him. Great shot blocker, though, and he could also stretch the floor. His form is beautiful. We shot a decent three-point percentage in college on a few attempts per game, and he also is a little bit older. I believe he spent three years at Dayton, so he can contribute right now as well. And I just feel like he's the best of both worlds as a defensive-oriented center that could also score and stretch the floor. And he is just my overall favorite prospect. And I heard he hustles hard no matter what. He doesn't put his head down. He doesn't let his offense affect his defense. He has active hands 100% of the time. Really seems like a heat culture guy. And that is why he is my favorite big in the draft. Now, I do want to move on to guards a little bit where here I also have four, five, six, seven. I have eight guys in this category. The first of which, I, I didn't necessarily rank them in the order of who I want versus the, the most versus the least because it changes a lot. Now, I know who I do want the most. I'll save that to the last pick. But the first guy I want to talk about is Ron Holland, who is a very raw prospect coming from the G League at night. He's about 6'8", gets to the rim at will, has a lot of great defensive potential because of his 6'8 frame. But the three-point shooting is atrocious. I shot like 26%. Just too raw of a prospect for my liking, even though he does have a ton of potential. Same is really said about Nikola Topic, another guy I dropped the video about recently. He's basically a 6'6 Goran Dragic with no jump shot. Now, his handle is amazing. His, his, his finishing ability is, is so crafty, can finish in a variety of ways. He's so tough at getting into the paint and finishing, but his shooting is just not good. And he's also one of the younger prospects. So again, potential through the roof, but just too raw for my liking right now. A guy that I just posted a video about yesterday was Rob Dillingham from Kentucky, a guy who is an elite shooter and not just spot up. He is one of the shiftiest, most change of pace players I've seen in a long time, has a crazy pull-up jumper game from the mid-range and from three, and he's just an overall bucket. That is what he does. He is a lethal scorer. And I do think he has some ability to pass the ball, but there's been some questions about it, whether he'd play point guard in the league. I don't think so. I do think he'd be more of a two, which is concerning because he has a very small frame at 6'1", and all the defensive liabilities that come with that. But his best comparison is Lou Williams. And as a Heat team that needs scoring, 
I kind of do like Rob Dillingham. He probably has the most talent out of this bunch of guards because he was even projected as high as number two a couple months ago. But I do think once he went in the combine, got his official 6'1 measurements, weighs like 164 pounds, I do think he dropped a little bit in the, the mocks because of that. But he is still uber, uber talented. The next guy I want to talk about is Tyler Kolick, a guy that uh, I think it was the ringer had the heat taking in their most recent mock draft. And he is basically your stereotypical white point guard, meaning he could do two things very well. He could shoot and he could pass the ball. And at 23 years old, he is also a prospect that I like a lot, not to mention that he came from Marquette and the Heat have some some history with taking guys from Marquette like D. Wade and now, I guess, Jimmy Butler. And shout out to Jay Crowder, too. But anyways, Tyler Kolick is the guy that can play right now. I do think the Heat still need a true point guard, a true facilitator, because Terry Rozier is okay at it. Tyler Hero has shown improvements, but they are still more scorers at the end of the day. So I do think Tyler Kolick could, could definitely play a role as a facilitator. Maybe he could start at points when guys are hurt, or he could just run the bench unit. And I do like him a lot in that regard. I also got Jacoby Walter who was also kind of a bucket, but he was very inefficient at Baylor, and I just think uh, he's still too raw a prospect. Don't got too much else to say about him, but he is a guy I do want to look into more personally. I also have Jared McCain, who is also another sniper, shot over 40% in college at Duke. Most of his, his attempts coming from three, takes a lot of transition threes, can get his shot off, excellent score, and I do think he can be a facilitator at the next level. He is a little bit bigger than Rob Dillingham, so I think that's good. And I don't, I don't think he's a better player than Rob Dillingham, but I do think fit-wise, he is a little bit better on the Miami Heat. He also is 20 years old, so he's a little bit older, not too much. But I do like Jared McCain as well. I also want to talk about Devin Carter. Seems to be a favorite of a lot of Heat fans. He's a guy that was ranked mid-first round. Now he's gone as high as seven in some mocks. He's a bit of an older prospect, Anthony Carter's son, current assistant coach in the Miami Heat, elite defensive player, a guy that will hound you on defense, fight through screens. He is only 6'3", but averaged nine boards a game, so he's elite at that too. There's some questions with the jumper, but in his senior, or I think, yes, his senior season in college at Colorado, he, his, he shot almost 40% from three, so we don't know if it's fluky or not, but he obviously did show the potential there. And lastly, my favorite prospect, Isaiah Collier. Everything that I'm going to say about Isaiah Collier makes me sound hypocritical because he is a he is shorter and he has questions shooting. You know, there's shooting concerns there. Those are all things I don't like. But I just I got a good feeling about Isaiah Collier, man, because even though he's only about 6'3, he is he has broad shoulders, he's strong and he's physical, super muscular, and he can get to the rim at will knows how to use his body, very crafty at finishing his layups, and it's his size that I think will make him a very, very great defender on the defensive end. I think he will be big enough to guard a lot of twos, maybe some threes, and the jump shot wasn't perfect, only about 34% from three in college, but it's not terrible, and I do think his form was good enough that shows me some promise going into his shooting future. So he is my favorite guard prospect in the draft. Maybe my favorite prospect in the draft. I just love the rim pressure that he provides. And he's also a decent facilitator on top of all of that stuff. So those are kind of my favorite prospects from kind of the two categories there. Bigs and guards. Now, should the Heat draft more of a project or should they get a guy who's ready? Well, I've been saying it most of this time. I prefer the guys that are more older because in theory, they're ready to play now. Uh, I, I kind of culminated that list here. I, I counted older as guys who are 21 years old or older. And that list is Zach Eady, Tristan De Silva, Tyler Kolick, Deron Holmes II, and Devin Carter. Now, I don't think all those guys are ready to play right now, specifically Zach Eady. I would argue the rest of these guys prob probably are ready to play now. Uh, but just on a Heat team that is trying to win a championship, I don't want a project. You know, there's time, there's a time and a place for a project. Maybe they do it in the second round. But I just honestly, I want the guy that can sort of contribute now, just like Jame Hakes, right? That's part of the reason I love the Jame Hakes pick. And sure enough, he came in and was pretty much as great as any of us could have expected. Because, yeah, we love Nikola Jovic now. But when he was drafted, he really didn't see the floor for like a year and a half, two years. 
And now I think he'll be a pretty decent player. But when you only got a couple years left of Jimmy Butler's prime, I'm trying to win right now. I want to get the Reti now player. Although, again, if they're looking to make some trades, maybe the higher trade asset is the guy that has more potential. Who knows? Because I think Jaime Hawkins has a lot of potential now. And that's because he was ready to come into the league and show what he can do immediately. And he has some high trade value because of that. Now, do the Heat even keep their first or second round pick? I don't know. I mean, one reason I think they should keep the pick is because it's a cheap contract and you already have a ton of money tied up into Jimmy and Bam and Terry and Tyler and Duncan Robinson, and you need some good value contracts to help fill out the roster. That's how you get some depth. But on the other hand, they could still get a good value player in the undrafted territory, like they always do, like Duncan Robinson and Gabe Vincent and Max Struess, even though Max Struess, you know, was in the league a little bit prior, but he was still undrafted, same as Kendrick Nunn, you know what I mean? There is these guys in the undrafted territory. So maybe the Heat even trade out of their first round pick to go into the second round, get two second round picks. Maybe they trade them both to get undrafted guys. Or maybe they trade them both and Donovan Mitchell's on the, on the Miami Heat in the week. Who knows? Now, I don't think that would happen because he's not eligible to. No, actually, he is eligible to sign his extension. I read that guy, uh, some guys like him and Bam are eligible to sign prior to July 6th. And he is one of them. So the fact that he hasn't signed yet, it's good news for the Miami Heat. Now, Jimmy Butler, he's not actually eligible to July 6th or July 7th to technically sign. So there's still some holdup on them, but we'll see what happens. But that's pretty much all I got to say regarding the draft. Let me know what y'all value down below. Do you want to go big? Do you want to go small? Do you like projects or do you like win now players? Let me know your favorite prospects down below. And I will be having some more draft coverage going forward. Now, outside of the Miami Heat's, there's a couple other interesting things going on around the league. You had your first trade. That was exciting. Alex Caruso was sent to the Oklahoma City Thunder in exchange for Josh Giddy and nothing else. I kept refreshing Twitter to see what kind of picks the Thunder would attach because I know they got a thousand of them. They don't even have the roster spots to fill out all those picks. But no, the Chicago Bulls being the terrible franchise that they are, get no picks with it. Now, I'll be honest though. I don't think it's as bad a trade as a lot of people think because I personally still do think Josh Giddey is a very good player. I just don't think he was in a great role for him in OKC because he needs to be ball dominant, can't shoot well enough to be off ball. And obviously in OKC, Shea is getting a ton of the reps there. But basically from a, and obviously for OKC, great trade. Caruso is a hooper. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about as how this impacts the Heat because I do think the Bulls were a potential trade partner for the Heat. And obviously, a lot of Heat fans, including myself, would have loved Alex Caruso because he fits perfect here. I would have liked to get Trey Young, pair him with a defensive guard. Caruso would have been perfect. I also don't hate Nikola Vucevic, especially since he's looked at as a negative asset. I feel like we could have taken him on from the Bulls with Alex Caruso. So there's options there that I think the Heat could have used to at least change their roster to not run it back and now that Caruso is out of the picture I do think that eliminates a lot of those things because I don't really see an avenue for the Heat and Bulls to make a deal without Caruso why would the Bulls want Tyler Hero now they just got Josh Giddy. they already got Kobe White you know as Zach Levine they the Bulls will trade him but you haven't really heard the Heat's name in there thank God because I don't want him anyways so I just I, I don't think that there's really an avenue there so that does change things a little bit because I do think Caruso was a legitimate guy that the Heat could have targeted, obviously, because he didn't really go for that much. But that's not going to happen. I also want to talk about J.J. Redick, who officially got hired by the Los Angeles Lakers. Now, I don't really like it, truthfully, for a couple reasons. One, I don't like the idea of former players getting head coaching jobs immediately when they have no experience. J.J. Redick was coaching his son's AAU team, and now he's the head coach of the damn Lakers. I don't think that's fair to a lot of assistant coaches like Chris Quinn on the Heat, for example, who have been busting their ass for years and are certainly more than qualified to get a head coaching job, but J.J. gets it just because of his name. I also think it's a really weird dynamic because he has a podcast with LeBron, which might end, which also sucks because it was a good podcast. But if you're a player on that team, particularly a young player, how are you going to look at that and say, oh, uh, my, our best player has a podcast with our coach. They're talking about us on the podcast. They're best friends. LeBron and him are the same age. I don't know. It just seems like a weird dynamic. Maybe I'm overthinking it. It just doesn't make a ton of sense. And also on top of all of that, from a Heat fan perspective, I kind of wanted LeBron. 
and it didn't sound like he was really leaving over these last couple months. I was hoping maybe if the Heat could draft Bronny, it'd be a nice bargaining chip to get LeBron over here because I still do think LeBron is a top five player in this game, and I would have loved him to return to South Beach. And I started getting a little hopeful when the Lakers said they were going to hire Reddick, then hire, hire Hurley, then Hurley said no, then they don't know about Reddick. And I was thinking maybe if that whole situation could collapse, LeBron would ask out and want to leave and go elsewhere. But they just hired his boy JJ, which they, the report came out. LeBron had nothing to do with the JJ siren, uh, hiring, which is just stupid. Like, why are they? Why do they want us to? Why are they even think that we would believe LeBron had no say in that? That's just stupid. But anyways, they obviously got his boy, so LeBron is not leaving, and that's that. The last thing I wanted to talk about was Paul George. It does seem like there's a lots of conflicting rumors on what he's gonna do. At first, Philly was all in. And now Philly doesn't want him. They prefer Zach Levine. They prefer Jimmy Butler. At first, the Clippers don't want to re-sign Paul George. Now they believe he's going to stay. That's why I think all NBA offseason reporting is stupid because it's all narrative-based agendas and conflicting rumors. I just wanted to ask y'all from a Heat fan perspective, do you want to get in there on Paul George? Is that someone that interests you? It does not interest me because I think he's a habitual playoff choker and I don't want the man anywhere near my team. Now, in theory, it makes sense. A great two-way player that could score, you know, and play defense and switch, but just not a fan of Paul George. I'm going to leave it at that, though, because I do plan on having a full Paul George video out at some point within the next week or two, maybe. We'll see how much draft coverage uh, we really got to talk about. But I just wanted to let y'all know y'all thoughts down below on Paul George. Now, that's all I got to say for this video. If you stay to the end of this video, I know you a real one. And if you want to prove to me that you're a real one, go ahead and comment down below. Let's say, uh, just say uh, Panthers in seven, baby. That way I know you uh, you stay to the end. I'll give you a heart a comment, and it means a lot to me. All the support genuinely does. Make sure to like the video and subscribe because I'm on my grind to hit 5K subs by the start of next season. Check out the audio podcast. Just search Believe in Miami Heats. That's B-L-E-A-V. And if you're on the audio side, come over to the YouTube, search Anthony DiNardo, and do all those good things I was just talking about. But I'm going to see you all next time. Look, pull up in the city, tryna get that dead fast sight. Do it on my own, I don't need no dead weight. Right? Had to kill him off, yeah, I need a headspace. You know this homegrown bitch don't offend me. Hmm.